The subject of cyber security is of course running hot and in fact that is going to confine the Minister time-wise this morning because she has obviously a very busy schedule. Uh, but cyber security is currently at the forefront of the media and public debate and the recent events surrounding uh, Optus and today Medibank uh, private data breaches remind us just how valuable on the one hand data is but also how vulnerable our personal information is um, for, uh, for all of us. Cyber attacks affect the lives of all Australians and they are increasingly doing so on almost a daily basis. An effective response to this issue will require collaboration from both the public sector and from the private sector and of course from the community in the broad. All of this makes today's discussion even more important. It's my great honour and pleasure to introduce our two discussants this morning the Honourable Claire O'Neill, MP, Minister for Home Affairs and Minister for Cyber Security. Minister, welcome. Uh, and Professor Kieran Martin, the Blavatnik School of Government, University of Oxford. Minister O'Neill was first elected to the Federal Parliament in 2013 and represents the electorate of Hotham in Victoria, South East Melbourne. The Minister holds a Master's in Public Policy from Harvard University and has held various roles across the private and public sector, including her appointment in 2019 as the Shadow Minister for Innovation, Technology and the Future of Work. And then, of course, early this year, uh, Minister O'Neill was appointed to the Home Affairs and the Cyber Security Portfolios. Kieran Martin is Professor of Practice in the Management of Public Organisations at Oxford University. Prior to joining Oxford, Kieran was the founding chief executive of the UK's National Cyber Security Centre, a facility that some of you in this room I know are very familiar with. During that time, he led the UK from, astonishingly, the eighth position in the world to the first position in the world in the International Telecommunications Union's Global Cyber Security Index. That's quite an achievement. The UK's National Cyber Security Centre has been a model that's been studied by many and adopted by some countries, including Canada and our own country. And uh, I had the great privilege while serving in government to visit on several occasions the British uh, National Cyber Security Centre and draw inspiration from it. I'd like to call now on Minister O'Neill and Professor Martin to lead us in a discussion. Uh, they're going to take uh, seats at the front here. Uh, the Minister will have to leave uh, in a short while uh, to confront some breaking uh, issues. But Minister, I really appreciate you being here and Kieran for travelling from the UK to join us this morning. Thank you. Well, good morning, everyone, and it falls to me, um, Catherine from CyberCX, to chair this dialogue this morning. And I'm going to cut straight to the chase because our time is limited. Minister, it is in some sense both the best and worst of times in cyber in Australia. Worst for the obvious reasons, best because it gives us a chance to pause and think about how we can do things better. Uh, so my first question uh, to you this morning, uh, Minister, is as we think about the, the uh, data breach deluge that we have experienced, and as you think about it, uh, what can we be doing at a meta level? I'm not going to draw you on what you're going to be hauled through in the media today, but at a meta level, how do we think about responding to these types of incidents better in future? Okay, <clears throat> thank you so much. Before we get on to that, can I just acknowledge some very important people in this room? We've got the Secretary of my department, Mike Pizzullo, Rachel Noble, um, two people with whom I work incredibly closely on cyber issues and great cyber leaders for our country. And Duncan, your service to our country is truly remarkable and we're so grateful for it and also personally very grateful for your friendship to me. Um, and thank you to CyberCS CX for having us. And Kieran, what a thrill. <clears throat> of course, we all know Kieran is a major cyber celebrity if you're interested in this field of work. <laughs> he is the man. Um, and I was so looking forward to having a bit of a relaxed discussion with you this morning. Um, but that, unfortunately, is not going to be possible. So I, I'm sure all of you in the room are aware that overnight um, the attackers of Medibank have started to release some data online. Um, so maybe if I can share a little bit of, of um, some thoughts on this. Um, 
I don't have words to express the disgust I feel at crimes of this nature. We, we went through Optus recently where the things at risk were mainly financial and you can replace a credit card and you can refund money to people who have it stolen from them. The fact that people's personal health information is being held over their head is just disgusting to me. Um, and it just shows us that these cyber criminals who we are joined in a fight against between the Five Eyes and other friends and partners around the world, uh, they are just disgraceful human beings and we need to step up and do everything we can to fight back against them. I really want Australians to understand that this is not happening because Medibank did not pay a ransom. That is crucial for people to realise. And I know that with great entitlement, there will be millions of Australians waking up this morning angry and fearful about what will be done with their data. It didn't happen because Medibank didn't pay the ransom. And Kieran, it'll be really interesting to hear some of your thoughts about this, but what we see so often with these incidents is that companies in desperation pay a ransom and then the data is used to re-victimise and re-victimise and re-victimise. We cannot live in a world where people can do this sort of thing and benefit financially from it. This enables and empowers the very disgraceful human beings who are at the heart of this and we cannot allow that to happen. Now, um, you asked about cyber incident response. Um, the Australian government has been preparing for this eventuality for, um, for some weeks. So as soon as, the, as soon as it became clear that the Medibank um, attack involved the theft of data, I um, activated something called the National Coordination Mechanism. So this is the first time in Australia that the National Coordination Mechanism has been activated in the event of a cyber attack. The former government created this as a crisis response mechanism during COVID, and it was set up to deal with the most difficult, intractable, urgent problems um, that were being experienced at that time. It is an unbelievably effective way for us to elevate the urgency of a problem across all levels of government and community and business, and to bring together people who need to work together to solve a problem who may not used to be working together. And one of the things that's very um, unique about cyber incidents is that uh, they each have their own specific character and impacts. So I know that for a lot of um, you know, consumers, they probably see a lot of similarities between Optus and Medibank, and there are some similarities in what's going on there. But fundamentally, they're about very different types of information, and the response from government has to be very different. So the national coordination mechanism has included state and federal governments, it's included um, extensive interaction with the health system, with Services Australia, um, and with uh, different parts of business as well. So one of the interesting engagements with the NCM has been with social media companies. So what's really important from my perspective, and I say this as the minister and as an Australian, for media companies in this country, there may be very uh, important health information about people being released into the public realm over the coming weeks, please do not republish it. I know you will not do that because that would be enabling and supporting the scumbags who are at the heart of these crimes. Social media companies, uh, we have worked with them collaboratively to see how they can meet their public obligations to make sure that wherever possible information is immediately taken down because that information is private and it belongs to the person who is being victimised. Please do not help them by republishing and by failing to take down this information as soon as you can. So I will have uh, a bit more to say about uh, this incident as the day progresses. We are having an NCM meeting um, this morning that's been established as a process to deal with this exact situation. I don't want people to be fearful, but a number of people have said this is a big wake up call for our country. We cannot allow this to continue. And so the discussion here this morning is very timely and we're very lucky to have one of the world's experts with me right here. Kieran, ransomware, tell us. <laughs> well, um, thank you for that. Thanks everybody for coming. Lovely to see so many old friends. I'll try and be as brief as possible because um, your time is even more valuable today than uh, normal. So I think firstly, in terms of response to this, 
uh, genuinely, um, I would pay tribute to you and to the Government of Australia because political leadership does matter in these circumstances and it, you don't always uh, get it. And as someone who dealt with a couple of thousand incidents over six, seven years, when you have cabinet level political leadership gripping a problem, it does make a difference. It energises state capabilities. We have the head of ASD here. Um, it energises the private sector capabilities. You have to have a team response, so that matters. Ransomware. Details matter when you're considering this, and details are easily um, misunderstood. So you mentioned, I entirely endorse what you said about this didn't happen because the company failed to pay a ransom. There are two types of demands for ransom generally in these cases. One is when you're locked out, so that's an availability issue. I will sell you a key to let you back in. You can see why that can, and I'm not talking about the ethics and morality here, but you can see why that can work as a proposal by the criminals. You can't work, you can't operate your system, you can't run the healthcare system, you can't run the operating system for a pipeline, etc. So I'm going to give you a key. Oh, and look, I've published on my dark website, I've published 25 other cases where I've provided a key and you've got back. So that is where that sort of moral hazard that you mentioned, where in these awful situations, sometimes individual organizations think, perhaps wrongly, often wrongly, think it's in their interest to pay. This is not one of those cases. This is about data breaches. This is not about availability of the system. That difference really matters, and you're absolutely right. There seems to me to be no possibility of buying any form of recovery here, because you can never prove that the data has been disposed of. So you can always come back for more. Now, that's a little bit technical, but it's not that technical. And if we're going to have a serious and grown-up conversation with our citizens across the UK, the um, Australia, other similar countries, we need to be open about these differences because a case where, in, as in Ireland 18 months ago, the hospital um, network of booking appointments isn't working, that's a different problem from this, and that sort of detail matters. The final point strategically, I think, that we need to try to, to, to grip from uh, this is about the nature of the threat we face, these scumbags, as you elo eloquently and correctly uh, put it, and what we can do about them. <clears throat> so look, we do have a serious safe haven problem. A lot of it's to do with Russia and surrounding countries. Not all of it, but quite a lot of it uh, is. And I'm afraid we have to face up to the reality that there are pretty effective, well-organized, not always technically sophisticated, but in some of these cases, strikingly uh, more than in the past, who are able to operate with impunity. And we can moan about that, or we can work out, well, what are the consequences of that? There are things we can do operationally across the Five Eyes to try and contain it tactically. There's diplomatic pressure that President Biden has led against Russia for well over, uh, well over a year at now. But we have to accept as companies, as governments, as society, that this threat is here, and it's harder to do something about it than it is to do for other threat actors because it's based in unfriendly countries with whom we don't have law enforcement arrangements. So we have to treat data as the valuable commodity it is and protect it properly and harden our defences. That is a big lesson from this. Thank you. That was a whirlwind tour. Minister, at this point, uh, I, I am advised that I need to give you a, a chance to, to leave to deal with the issues of the day. Um, so unless you have any burning responses to, to what Kieran... One, one, OK, well, I've got one more question for you. So we know you're uh, rewriting Australia's cyber strategy at the moment. There must be a whole range of priority issues uh, animating you there. Perhaps you could share uh, for this group and the audience on YouTube uh, what some of your priorities are as you review that strategy. Yeah, fantastic. So that's a, a really great question for me to answer before I leave because I want to talk about opportunity. There is some pretty bad things going on in this country in cyber security at the moment and I think that's obvious for all to see as well as these probably the two biggest cyber attacks in Australian history happening within three weeks of one another. We also have, you know, the National Australia Bank telling us that they're getting 50 million cyber attacks a month. The Australian Taxation Office getting 3 million cyber attacks a month. So I think we know we've got to step up here. And if there is um, anything at all uh, that's positive that's come from these incidents, it's that there is universal interest at the moment in seeing what Australians can do 
to change the situation. And when, uh, you know, a lot of the cybersecurity discussion and during the time that you're at GCHQ, Kieran, you know, the challenge was getting boards to engage and getting them interested and active in this stuff. We don't have that problem in Australia at the moment. And I see enormous, enormous engagement from everyone who's got power to change this, to, to roll up their sleeves and get involved. And the cyber strategy is about bringing all that goodwill and all that opportunity together and making sure that we do shift the situation. And I can tell you really honestly, I actually truly believe that Australia can be the most cyber safe country in the world. And I'll tell you why. We have um, a brilliant cyber security industry. We're here this morning hosted by Cyber CX. We need to support that industry to grow, but what's there at the moment is world leading. We've got really incredible skills in this country. We need more of them and part of my role in um, response, in resp with responsibility for the immigration system is, is to help us do that. We have amazing government infrastructure sitting there working so hard doing amazing things on cyber security. So I mentioned the Australian Signals Directorate. We're so lucky to have the Australian Signals Directorate. The smartest cyber security people in our country work for the Australian government and most countries in the world can't say that. And you know, when I travel the world, people are so envious of the ASD and they're envious of some of the great legislative things that um, Secretary Pizzullo was leading um, in the last parliament. So we've actually got the bones of something that's really special here. And there's one more thing that we have that I don't see in a lot of other countries in the world at the moment. And that is we have a parliament that actually works. Now, I know everyone's very down on Australian democracy, and I see that. But I went to the Five Eyes um, Home Affairs Minister's gathering in Washington earlier this year. Um, the legislation that we have to deal with cyber incidents is the envy of the world. There's a lot we need to do to improve that law, and, and I would like to see that as part of the cyber strategy. But I know that we can create a legislative environment here that creates the best environment for our cyber industry and that really helps protect Australians in meaningful ways. And if I can say one more thing, you know, something that I've really observed just in the time that I've been in this job, um, just over five months, the um, collaboration between the Australian Signals Directorate and the Australian Federal Police is so powerful. And between the two of these organisations, they have networks with police and equivalent Signals Directorates all over the world. So I think the big message here is we, we're not going to um, stand back and think there's nothing we can do about this problem. In fact, when Secretary Pizzullo was in uh, Washington last week, um, Australia was given the opportunity to host a global ransomware initiative where we are literally coordinating the ransomware activities of, I think it's 37 other countries, Mike? Yeah, 37 other countries. We are going to lead that. That's the Australian government's commitment to fighting this problem. So we've got a cabinet minister for the first time with responsibility for cyber security, and we are using that to step up the fight against this. And it's a fight that I really believe we're gonna win. That is a very energising note to leave on, Minister, and I'll leave you to your Thank your you, day. my apologies. I really wish that I could stay, but I, I do need to deal with this next episode. We'll give a few moments uh, for the, the great uh, minister and her, her advisers to leave the room. And then we'll change pace a little bit. We've been very frenetic this morning and we'll, we'll relax a, bit, a little bit now as we delve into the next phase of this morning, which is a conversation with our very own cyber celebrity, uh, Professor Martin. And the way we'll run this is we've got um, about half an hour for a conversation uh, between me and Kieran, and then we'll also have a chance for engagement and questions from the audience as well. So if there's a burning cyber question in your mind, we will have a chance to come to that. Um, but for now, in terms of where we... Well, I would love to take this conversation. There's a range of, of areas, but I want to stay uh, first with Australia and our responses. And we have just heard a really energising uh, message from the, the Minister about her ambitions for Australia. Uh, but on the other hand, Kieran, I've also heard you talk about the risks of catastrophizing cyber. If we get too worried, too scared, if we focus too much on the kind of the wicked problems we can't solve, it might not encourage us to step up where we need it. So I'm actually interested in your how you 
would approach almost the rhetorical balance of cyber between owning up to what a serious problem this is, but also having a message of empowerment uh, and emphasising where we can act as well. So, um, great questions, and uh, yeah, I'll try and take it at a gentler uh, pace. Um, I suppose to respond to some of the things the Minister said when she talked about uh, people talking about whether Australian democracy and government was functioning, uh, it depends on your starting point, but it looks pretty good from my perspective after the last, <laughs> after the last few months. Um, so, um, and genuinely, I think it is striking just to see the sort of way in which this uh, spate of incidents have galvanised the sort of government and, uh, and private community. In terms of catastrophising and response, um, I'll, I'll, I'll break it down a bit. So the catastrophising point, um, it's been around for decades. You know, we've had the necessary at the time, but probably in the long run strategically unhelpful rhetoric of cyber Pearl Harbors and cyber 9-11 and so forth. And we had it all back, particularly, I don't know what it was like here, but well, because I wasn't um, uh, physically present uh, in Australia in February, but particularly at the time of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. You know, I'm thinking back to a big article in one of the UK's most important Sunday newspapers, uh, double page spread across the main section saying uh, paralysis, this is how Russian hackers will cripple the United Kingdom. And it was all about trains not working, ATMs not working, lights going out all at the same time and the total paralysis of a society. And clearly, that's the sort of thing that's been warned about for 40 years since the War Games movie, if you remember that, or anybody of my generation and older, where they accidentally start a nuclear war by hacking into a computing shop and so forth. And it didn't happen in the last 40 years, and it hasn't happened and wasn't likely to happen in the context of Russia-Ukraine. What is likely to happen is the sort of thing we're talking about now, the sort of uh, disruptions we saw to healthcare, which um, has been a huge problem in Europe and North America for years, the wholesale loss of data, the wholesale interruption of essential services, the harassment, the intimidation, um, the misinformation and so forth. It, it, cyber is a much more pernicious, chronic set of harms than a sort of cat catastrophic uh, one. Now, it can be awful for individual organizations, and so what's happening in Australia is a really good example of that. It's awful for the organizations concerned and for their um, uh, customers. It doesn't, it's, it, it doesn't physically hurt anybody, let alone sort of um, uh, uh, kill them, but it damages people's confidence in, in, the, in the data economy. Now, things like that matter be, for all sorts of reasons, um, but in particular, if you focus at the catastrophic end of the problem, a, you're probably chasing the least likely, the less likely risks. And secondly, you're slightly infantilized. You know, there are big strategic threats to things like power grids and uh, so forth. There are targeted major nation state attacks where a country will pay, pay um, a hostile state will put a lot of time and effort into one operation. And there's not a great deal that medium-sized organizations can do about that if you're unlucky enough to be the target of it. So you're infantilized to think, well, there's nothing I can do. But when you look at that sort of suite of pernicious harms and so forth, there's all sorts of things we can do. And I'll just pick on a few examples. One is societal, and I really wanted to pick up, I should have picked it up while she was here, on the minister's point about the agency of publishing leaked data. That's a really powerful thing. No one should host this on the open internet. Uh, whatever comes out of this breach or any other breach, no one should host it on the open internet. And no one is likely to. But that is a big mitigation of harm. Then we should look through law enforcement cooperation as where it's appearing on the dark web and see what we can do about it. So already you can see there's some, there's some agency here. Secretary Pizzullo's point, he briefed me yesterday evening on what's come out of Washington from this ransomware task force. 37 countries, basically a, coalition, a voluntary coalition of the willing, ranging from superpowers, advanced digital economies, all the way through to much smaller countries. And they're agreeing to do stuff. And you know what? I'm not going to brief out the details because they're really boring. But they matter. Um, and so stuff like this across 37 countries about tracking cryptocurrency payments, about building a shared platform where you can work out who's up to what and where things are occurring, it's deathly dull. But it really sort of, it really sort of matters. To go back to publishing the information, it's not just about healthcare. But I remember in 2020, just before the presidential election, the Washington Post published an editorial statement saying, unlike in 2016, if we have suspicions about the source of a piece of, uh, about the source of a politically controversial uh, piece of information, we're going to apply different thresholds to publishing it. That again shows you the agency society has in, in doing all of this. And then you get back to things, so 
you know, I know there's a policy review underway because of what's been happening in, uh, in Australia. There are policy reviews on cyber policy all over the place. But it doesn't have to be confined to the simple, does the government legislate or does the government not legislate? There are other things. What about a dialogue with the insurance industry that's a bit more intensive to say, well, hang on, we've been trying to figure out cyber insurance for 10 years to try and utilize insurance as normal social good function of essentially um, incentivizing people to manage risk better. But it's not really working in cyberspace in lots of different areas. Why not? Can we have a discussion about that? What would work? Uh, corporate governance reforms, there are all sorts of things, again, often quite tedious, but can just chip away at some of this um, problem. And those are the, some of the things we should be looking at. So if we just have this catastrophic picture of everything's going to blow up and there's nothing, um, A, we think there's nothing we can do, B, we're chasing the wrong problem, and we're ignoring the whole bunch of things that we can do at a technical, organizational, societal level to reduce, not eliminate, but reduce the risks and the severity of the incidents that happen. So boring can be good. Boring's excellent in cybersecurity. <laughs> yeah. And I'm going to stay on that theme for a moment. So you've highlighted a couple of areas short of um, the big legal stick where we could potentially low-hanging fruit for, for moving the needle on cyber. So insurance, corporate governance. If you were uh, redrafting Australia's cyber strategy, what are some other areas uh, where you think there's a potential uh, for, for, for really moving that, that needle, whether it's in law enforcement, whether it's in corporate governance areas, what would be your kind of say, top three um, measures to change what we're doing for the better? Well, Australia has already put in place some pretty tough critical infrastructure um, regulation, and I think that's really important, and it's pretty sensibly framed in terms of managing risks to the sort of outcomes. Um, again, it's not um, how it's implemented matters, so it would dis discourage a sort of compliance based approach and actually try and regulate the sort of outcomes. You know, financial services have been quite good at this. You sort of try and, um, not least because for decades, banks have been trying to eliminate the threats of, uh, or reduce the threats from rogue traders. So you can't stop somebody moving around some money in a bank, but you can stop them moving enough around that topples the bank. And that's a sort of, you know, it's a good approach to uh, cybersecurity. So I think there's a way of implementing that type of critical regulation and onto the areas that most uh, matter. So that's, that's uh, one point. I think a second thing um, is about getting the sort of um, cybersecurity market and capabilities sort of functioning better. So one of the things that I think is going to be a real challenge for Australia now, given the moment we're in, you know, everybody's paying attention to it. Uh, raising awareness is not a problem in Australia at the minute of cyber uh, cybersecurity. So here's a here's a question for the community: If you have a well-intentioned but largely technically inexpert board of directors of a company. Um, but they say, look, we've got to get serious about this. We're going to act in good faith. We're going to put aside money. We're going to put aside time and give a proper support. What do they do? Where do they go? What capabilities? You know, how do you help them understand what they need? And then how do you help them understand in a very fast-changing sort of marketplace what's good and, and what's not? And there, there are things there. I mean, as technology changes, governments, partly through regulation, partly through voluntary cooperation with industry, are, are making improvements. So IoT is the classic. So uh, traditionally, if you wanted to go more secure uh, on, in the online world, it was really hard because the economic model was, I want a web-based service for free, and essentially I'm going to give away my personal data or my corporate data in order to get free access to that service. IoT changes that. You buy something often that you can hold or see or touch. Um, you have a, you, you, so you can inspect the hardware, you can put trading standards in on it, and you can regulate the service as well. And consumers, if properly informed, can choose to pay more for security, or and they can they can adjust their risk accordingly. Think of things, and so you know um, there were some really serious IoT-based attacks five six years ago where people hacked you know, hundreds of thousands of CCTV cameras. They were able to do that because the default password was password. And if you spotted that, you couldn't change it because of the way they were built. So even if you were doing the right thing, you just couldn't change it because you'd bought cheap stuff. Those in the UK, EU, Singapore, I don't know about Australia, it's now illegal to do that. Um, and there are other ways of sort of viewing how you um, do, uh, what sort of capabilities you buy. So that's a sort of second thing. 
think of the well-intentioned board and think, do they have the right information? Is the market working properly? And if not, how do you get it working properly so that they can know uh, what, to, uh, uh, what, what to buy? The third thing, at the risk of slightly repeating myself, I do think we have to think about the governance of data. Um, and, uh, you know, this has been a reminder. Um, and I'm not just saying, you know, it, coming from uh, a country which, although no longer in the European Union, is still governed by the General Data Protection Regulation. So if you like the, the world's flagship data regulation. You know, I think it's interesting. I'm not going to be polemical or ideological about GDPR. I think it's just interesting to look at the lessons of something like GDPR. So in a good way, it completely removed the uh, previous practice of cover it up and hope for the best. It just changed the legal balance around that. And that was very, very common where I, where I grew up, you know, uh, cover it up and hope for the best. And now you just said, well, that's not worth the risk. Uh, so it forced people to take data governance uh, very, very uh, seriously. On the other hand, because it wasn't sort of holistic, it meant that, and if you look at, for example, again, the Irish healthcare system, um, until personal data was, so the whole healthcare system for the entire state was wrecked, right? And because initially it didn't violate any data protection laws, there were no regulatory penalties or incentives uh, for it. As soon as personal data was in place, a whole ton of... So you can see the mismatch here between... You know, we did data regulation, so everyone stampeded towards, uh, oh, we'll govern data. There's a whole set of other risks that you didn't do, so you need to sort of think through it um, holistically. So we need to think through data governance, data regulation, but in the context of other risks as well. And it would be remiss of me if I didn't point out, I think the ANU um, Professor Nick Biddle this week has put out a piece of uh, research that says 90% of Australians are in favour of uh, data protection regulation. So we know it's a, it's a topic that's in the mind of politicians, but also in the public's mind. Um, if I can take you to this, this well-meaning corporate board of Australia that you're painting, maybe uh, it's a very policy, Canberra heavy audience in the room with us, but there will be uh, members of corporate Australia and broader society watching uh, this recording. And we talk a lot in Canberra circles about the, the impulse to reach for that regulatory or legislative measure, but that's not the conversations in, in boardrooms often. Um, if I was sitting in one of those boardrooms thinking, oh, we're talking a lot about law enforcement action against ransomware, we've got a ransomware task force, government's doing more to get serious about addressing cybercrime, we've got the smartest people in Australia in ASD, um, I might be thinking, well, what's my role in all of this as a, a member of corporate Australia? So perhaps could you shed some light there on the balance between what government's doing here, and it is doing a lot, but what, where that residual risk needs to be managed, and particularly if I'm thinking about the threat of ransomware, uh, should I be waiting for government to ride in on its white horse and, and kick the offshore cyber criminals out of, their, out of their safe haven lairs, or do I need to be doing something differently as well? So it's, it's, it's a really interesting question, and companies have to take uh, ownership of their own of their own risks, and we do have this issue in the digital age. I mean, it's always been there, but it's it's profound and acute in the digital age of what I would call the privatisation of national security risk. So I'll give you a very simple um, example um, from the UK this year. A supplier that I'd never heard of, and most people had never heard of, it supplied some IT services to the National Health Service. It got done over in a ransomware attack, and whilst the impact wasn't catastrophic, um, the 111 service, which is what you ring if you're not critically ill, but you want some advice, and millions people use it, plus some mental health scheduling services, just didn't work. So, um, you know, the government did step in a bit, and people were saying, why is the government helping this private company? It's because, you know, there are things which could constitute national security risk, including the provision of health care that are um, uh, predicated on private provision. Colonial Pipeline in the U.S. is the classic example of this, you know, a dangerous shortage of domestic gas for cars in the east coast of the United States, but all the decisions were taken by the private, um, uh, by, by, by the private company. So there are times when the government's incentivized to help, and actually working out uh, was well, something that was so complicated to the point that we in the UK just abandoned trying to develop a detailed policy for it was, you know, the precise criteria and when the government should step in. There was a sort of sense in very serious cases of a shared risk. It was too complicated and too time consuming to sort of precisely work out uh, how to allocate the risk, but you could never take away a huge element of the, of the risk from the public corporation. In fact, I remember, and I'm allowed to talk about this publicly by the company, I had a really interesting partnership with Unilever um, in the UK uh, during my time in office. Um, 
because although I suppose you could argue in the pandemic and lockdown they became more critically important, they sort of were proudly sort of saying, well, we're a big company, so we take cyber risk seriously, but I'm not sure you should worry about us. We make, we make canned soup and, you know, um, um, hygiene products. You know, we, other, people, other alternatives are available. You can cope without us. So they were a really interesting example of trying to, and this is why we worked with them, of trying to work out how to manage corporate risk in a situation where the government might not actually uh, care or be incentivized um, uh, to care. And there, you know, um, I think then it's worth thinking about, well, you know, if the government makes laws, we'll, um, uh, we will have to comply with them. But then I start thinking about, you know, um, what sort of discussion should you be having, what sort of policy should you be having at organizational level? And I know this is um, not a largely private sector audience, but it applies to the leadership of universities, it applies to the leadership and management of govern government organizations as well. There were two things that we tried very hard in the UK, with some success, but as ever limited, uh, two sort of conversations we would try to change. One is about the identification of risk. You, know, you cannot protect everything all of the time, so you do have to work out what matters. Is it a piece of intellectual property? Is it a data set? Um, you know, is it a connection to the controls of an operating system? Is it a combination of all of that? So what are the crown jewels and what deserves special um, uh, uh, um, uh, protection? You know, if you take the Optus example, you know, um, uh, it's, it's, it's the distinction between the fact that there are maybe 10,000 passports um, and driving licenses, uh, which are much more valuable than the millions of other pieces of, of, of data. So, you know, have a sort of forensic discussion about what sort of risks you're carrying. And then, and I feel really strongly about this, I don't often talk about culture, but I think culture is important here. One of the most dangerous things in the global cybersecurity ecosystem is the polite executive who's afraid of looking stupid, right? I'm really serious about this. It's the board that says, right, you know, right, this cyber thing, oh God, it's all over the news, better, better take this seriously. Okay, get me some cyber experts, come in, PowerPoint deck, this, 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 this. You don't understand a word of it, but you are afraid of looking stupid. I've seen this so many times, less so in recent years, but I used to see this all the time. And they'd say, right, okay, yeah, um, go and do that. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll have that program. This, that's terrible because you don't understand the risk. My favorite anecdote about this, I opened a security operations center in a major um, infrastructure plant in, in the UK. I won't say which one it was. And went in, and there was one of those, you've probably seen them, huge maps, uh, digital maps of the world with what we call the pew-pew um, part of cybersecurity, you know, the sort of the dots zinging all over and somebody's attacking somebody else. And there's this brilliant young analyst in his mid-20s. I've been talking to him about all sorts of really interesting things. He really knew his stuff. And I said, right, and pointed to this map, and something from the Kingdom of Jordan was firing something at the Republic of Chile. And I said, that point there, what does that mean? And he just laughed, and he said, you know perfectly well, sir, this stuff's just here for the tourists and the top brass, you know, and that is, that's bad cybersecurity, right? Don't buy the map that you don't understand. Don't buy the data set, the dashboard, you don't know how it works. Have the, um, and actually for the information security professionals, don't trade on other people's ignorance. And, um, you know, if you think you've presented the risks to the board and they don't understand it, so you've got away with it, and it was quite an easy meeting, that you'll repent at leisure from that point of view. You need them to understand what risks they've accepted, what budget they've given you to do what, and what capabilities and risk reduction they think they've bought from that. And if you don't understand it, just extend the meeting uh, or reschedule a different one. And I think those things are really important. Boring, good, pew-pew maps, bad. Pew-pew maps, bad. Um, <laughs> meetings meetings in plain English where you come away with an understanding of risk and what you've done to mitigate it, good. At the risk of getting a little bit philosophical, we're talking about risk, and you're saying, I'm a corporate board, I'm going to think about what my crown jewels are. But it occurs to me that sometimes what a corporation thinks its risk is, and its most, let's say, its most high-value assets, pre preserving shareholder value, keeping the lights on, etc., doesn't always perfectly map over onto what the national interest is. And I'm thinking, for example, a cyber risk uh, like the likelihood and impact of nation states hoovering up data sets and then using that big data in a way that's adverse to Australia's national interest. Now, if I'm just seeing a thin slice of that sitting inside corporate Australia, I might not value that risk or see its impact in the same way as, say, the national security community in Canberra would. Do you have some thoughts on how and to what extent um, corporations should take into account the national interest? And assuming that they, they won't or they, they can't, how do we 
uh, as um, members of the national security community, help them understand uh, the, the nuance there, or whether that's through regulation or education. So I think I have precisely two points, and they're based on real examples, and just sort of remember them. One's about BT, British Telecom, and the other's about the University of Oxford. So the one on BT essentially is about regulation, because there are parts of this conversation, and you're right, Catherine, to root it in, essentially in philosophical terms. There are points in this conversation where, you, where it then is ultimately sensible to um, reach for regulation. So again, a conversation that we're allowed to talk about in public. Um, as the National Cybersecurity Centre, as you might expect, had a pretty close and multifaceted relationship with British Telecom, with BT, on, on a number of uh, levels. And we did this precise exercise with them uh, in a really collaborative spirit. We said, We're, here are the 10 things that the government most cares about in BT. Can BT do the things that they most care about from a purely commercial shareholder value point of view? And we'll see which ones match. And so some of them did. But actually, at that particular point in BT's commercial history, and it's not a joke, it wouldn't be the same now, but at that particular point, the most important thing for BT was the maintenance of BT Sports' ability to broadcast, because they bet the farm on the expansion of their sports coverage, right, online. Now, obviously, from the point of view of the government and national security, I couldn't give a monkeys about BT Sport, right? But that's what they were geared up to do. So you ended up then having a conversation where, you know, and we had a conversation, I ended up in 2018 chairing a meeting of the chief execs of all of the major British telcos where we had the BT type conversation and they said, look, the time for asking us nicely to do things that you think are important for national security, it's run out of road. You've got to bake it into the regulatory system because if I do it and my competitor doesn't, you know, it doesn't make any sense. And there ended up a telecom security bill that's currently in its final stages of clearing parliament. So there are times, and that was, I think, a reasonably good way of having that conversation where they said, look, if you want to do this, and we support it, but you have to make it a level playing field, and that means regulatory reform. So that was what the example. The Oxford thing is a bit... Um, different and oh, yeah, it's a university but it's not um uh but you know i'm trying to i could think of other private uh, company examples but this one is so stark and it's about the change in risk profile so bt was always going to be as the principal telecommunications country, uh, company in the country it's always going to be strategically important but in 2020 um and that was the year where i made the transition first half of the year in government second half of the year at university of oxford and also you know the pandemic um and that year, uh, a little known part of the University of Oxford, you know, slightly run down building, not particularly up to date IT, but small number of absolutely brilliant people, known as the Jenner Institute, uh, became globally strategically important all of a sudden, right? So nobody was terribly interested. Maybe a few IP property, uh, intellectual property hackers were interested in some of their previous stuff, but all of a sudden these people were strategically crucial uh, to the development of what became the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine. So then, you know, you, do, you can't have a regulatory framework that predicts that. I mean, maybe you could, that you sort of designate things. But that's where, you know, the openness of the relationship, one of the, you know, NCSC, ACSC sort of founding principles, is you have to have something which is essentially a deal where you rely, and this is generally true in the UK, and certainly from what I know of Australia, it's true in Australia, you rely on essentially the sort of good citizenship, patriotism, and common decency of most business leaders who will, and, and as, long as, you as long as you present a sort of friendly and competent face to them from the government, they will say, look, you know, I'm not sure what to do about this, and we can then take a view, and you have to have that, and this was one of the weaknesses of the old system when it was behind the wire, and you couldn't contact anybody. You have to have things that are adaptable to that, and then maybe over time, if, you know, there's, a, as in, go back to the BT case, maybe you do have to change the law in the long term, but you have to have that discussion. From, um, and the deal is, the government needs to be friendly, competent, and treat it confidentially and sensitively. And the private sector, uh, the deal on that side is don't sue the government if you think other people are getting help. I and mean, that is really, really damaging. Uh, you know, when I think of, I mean, one of the things that I think allowed us to make some progress that wasn't available to the United States was if you take sort of the general sharing of information, I don't mean all that sort of systemic, you know, put everything into a common pot, but just the sort of dialogue with government. The Americans tied themselves up in knots for completely understandable reasons for years, trying to get legislation through Congress to provide indemnity for people who shared information with the government or with other members of their sector uh, from, from legal jeopardy. And in the UK, it just wasn't a problem. 
And therefore, that made life in the UK in this sort of issue so much easier. Because we just said, we would, we would have meetings with the big banks and we'd say, look, as soon as one of you sues us or sues each other for working with the government, all of this stops. Right? Any one legal, you know, the first legal letter, we just walk away. We cannot do this. And, you know, they, they bought into it. Um, so I would, there's something there about a deal between sensible leaders in both public and private. And the benefits of a, not an overly litigious society. Yeah, perhaps. no, absolutely. <laughs> and, you know, there's only a certain amount of cybersecurity government leaders can do about that. But we were blessed in the UK with reasonably pragmatic business leaders who wanted to do the right thing. I'm, I'm going to take the indulgence of one more question for myself, and then we'll open up to the floor. And that is to take us to Russia, Ukraine. And I know this is something you've been watching really closely. You've made public comments. You've put out a lot of interesting articles to help us understand this. And I wonder, and you've already alluded to it this morning, but I wonder if you can share with us a little bit your thinking about the role of cyber in that conflict. You've already told us it wasn't the one decisive domain as some anticipated, but I don't think many anticipated that it would be because no domain is ever entirely decisive in war. Um, but also, if you could put that in comparison with what we think might happen in the future. Imagine a crisis or a contingency in our own Indo-Pacific region here as we often do, and we certainly do more than we ever have in the past, what role might cyber uh, play in that conflict, and how might it actually be different um, from Russia, Ukraine, in the sense that we don't want to always be fighting the last war and thinking we've solved cyber because we saw how it played out in Russia, Ukraine. There may, in fact, be differences in future conflicts. What should we be prepared for? Okay, so this is very complicated and contentious stuff, and yeah, I think when you're discussing this, um, any aspect of the Russia-Ukraine war, we should always have the caveat that, you know, for big strategic lessons, it's too early to tell, you know, universally, if you like, uh, on all aspects of it. I think um, I make three points. The first two sort of depend on the audience, um, if you like, and depends how sort of technical and geeky it is versus how sort of generalist uh, geopolitical it is. So the first point, um, briefly recap what I already said, you know, there was this widespread commentary, including from you know, serious people in governments across the world of, of the catastrophic threat, which as you say, Catherine, was never likely to materialize in that way. You know, there weren't going to be you know, wholesale disruption of every aspect of life in major economies at national level all at the same time. You know, the sort of shutdown of normal uh, uh, life. But that was predicted. So that leads me to the second point, which is then when you get into very technical, geeky, you know, audiences um, um, and discussions on cybersecurity, they say to people like me, no, you're misunderstanding this. You know, there's been a lot of cyber in the conflict, and that is true. Um, it's just not been the type that, um, you know, some more sensationalist commentary um, uh, 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 predicted. So uh, to characterize it, um, there's probably been, you know, um, three aspects of it. One is a pretty, what seems to be a well executed um, operation by the Russians against satellite communications company Viasat, uh, which gave the Russians, in an otherwise poorly executed start to the campaign, a considerable advantage because the Ukrainians have said quite openly they found it quite hard to communicate amongst military commanders in the first days of the war. That's a big deal. You know, if you can time a sophisticated operation against uh, Viasat, which is why Elon Musk came in with Starlink uh, later because Viasat wasn't working, and you can degrade Ukrainian military communications, you can see the utility of cyber and war if you have a well-executed campaign and you time it properly. There were then sort of things about intimidating Ukrainians, you know, harassing government websites and so forth. They've been doing that for years. I'm not entirely sure what the strategic impact of that of that was. And then there's just been this sort of massive information contest between, you know, and where Ukraine is giving as good as it's got um, and as a sort of army of volunteers and so forth that are doing things that are mostly sort of pr propaganda value rather than strategic uh, value. So all of those things are very, very um, interesting. So in terms of lessons for the future, I think there are... Um, things to sort of watch out for and things to be realistic about. Um, the things to be realistic about are, um, you know, what, um, uh, I, I think cyber will always be a sort of supportive capability in war rather than a primary uh, capability. And, um, you know, what's been interesting is that 
after the war, from Putin's point of view, thankfully went very badly at the, at, at, at the start. There were a few attempts to do you know, quite sophisticated attacks, uh, but they all failed, A, because the Ukrainian defenses were far better and had been improved um, beyond all recognition since 2014, uh, but B, because you, know, you can't put these things together quickly. You know, if, if the Russians attacked the Ukrainian energy grid twice in 2015 and 2016, those operations took 18 and 31 months respectively from conception to execution. You can't do them in two weeks as they tried to do, and they were rubbish, right? Um, so, you know, there's a thing there where, you know, um, and this applies when we're thinking about our own offensive capabilities. You know, cyber is not a red button that you can suddenly just say, right, we're going to point it at that, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's interesting when Putin was cornered at the beginning of last month and started to lash out, he lashed out with actual missiles, not cyber attacks. So there's a th um, so you know we're not going to have a magic red button that will neutralise adversarial um, uh, capabilities. In the words of General Sir Patrick Sanders, the head of the British Army, you know you can't you can't cyber your way up a river. Um, but, um, so we need to be realistic about that, but we have seen through the Viasat hack that actually it can be a very, very powerful uh, tool um, when specifically surgically sort of planned and executed in a military uh, campaign. The final point, and I'm sort of slightly careful about this in public forums, the final point is, um, you know, there are things that the Russians could have done that were better reflective of some good capabilities. So if they had planned more Viasats in advance, you know, it could have been a lot, it could have been a lot worse. And secondly, for whatever reason, and you know, even notwithstanding what's happening in Australia now, you know, just the general chaos that you can cause in cyber, not through devastating attacks, but you know, of the Viasat type, but just by, you know, ransomware everywhere and all of that stuff, that hasn't happened to the extent that it might have. So the things to watch for the next, you know, for any future conflict are, you know, beware having more than one Viasat type quality attack because that's really quite difficult to counter because it's, you know, it's pretty um, technically accomplished stuff. And secondly, you know, there is, whilst it wouldn't be total paralysis of national life, there is a potential in a future conflict for just, right, you know, a rogue leader to say to a bunch of unsophisticated hackers, just go and do what you can to that country and cause as much disruption as, as possible. It won't kill anybody, but it'll make things very unpleasant and uncomfortable. And those are the sorts of things we need to watch out for. And I assume there's a psychological element there. I think often we, we focus on the material aspects and, and forget about the psychological morale factors and qualities of, of war, which to your second point there around um, DDoS of websites and yeah. disruption, uh, surely that has to be part of the strategic calculus there. It's demoralizing, if nothing else. Yeah, so, I mean, there is something in these conflicts, and the Russians have, you know, been reasonably affected at exploiting this, about um, trying to undermine confidence in people's, uh, undermine people's confidences in the, uh, in the competence of their own society and their own authorities. And there is something we've got to watch out for in that quite, um, uh, quite significantly. Also, that's the thing we've got to watch out for in peacetime. You know, it's, it's, happening, all the, it's happening all the time. But it does come back to this agency point. There are things we can do about that in terms of defenses and there are things about that in terms of you know the public discourse we have so actually you know I got and I'm allowed to say this now because I'm not in government I got slightly annoyed in the Russian uh, in the debate about Russian interference in the UK you know um, there were legitimate criticisms as articulated by a parliamentary committee about you know whether or not the state services took this seriously enough early enough and you know I accept some of the uh, criticisms there what what I think was dangerous about that whole narrative was there was an almost equating of intent with impact. And they're not the same thing. So, you know, uh, some of the stuff, you know, that the Russians have done in, say, destabilizing democracies in the United States 2016, you know, has been, sadly, from their point of view, enormously effective. I mean, whether it, I'm not talking about whether it changed the outcome of the election, but the fact that six years on, people in the United States are still arguing about the impact of Russian interference in 2016 made for, sadly, a very successful Russian operation. In the UK, and Sir Alex Younger, the former head of MI6, and Duncan will know well, you know, has been really clear about this, some of the stuff they did was absolute rubbish. So it's right to disclose that it's there, but if we say, and Alex Younger has been really powerful about this, if we say, all right, the Russians were having to go to an election, therefore, yeah, it's all terribly unsafe. We are doing the Russians' job for them. We're doing the Chinese, we're doing the adversary's job for them. If we allow 
without actually credible evidence, if we allow doubt to take hold about things like the integrity of elections and political discourse and so forth, then they don't have to try very hard. They just need to launch a field attack. And all of a sudden, we're sort of saying, mm, our democracies aren't as stable as we thought they were. No, we've got to actually have more confidence, look properly at evidence, have confidence in the strength of our own institutions and systems until proven otherwise. And that's a fantastic full circle point to come back to. We started talking about rhetoric and the, the penalty of catastrophizing, and now we're talking again about rhetoric and the need to ensure trust is maintained and we don't uh, do the adversaries' work for them. And at this juncture, uh, we have time for a couple of questions from the room. Um, Michael Shoebridge, your hand was first up, so we'll go to you. And I think there's a right. roving mic that is coming on your left. Kieran, lovely to hear you run through things, particularly with so many examples. I was going to ask you, how do you think the balance of cyber power is shifting and changing? Because I was struck by your comments about the uh, more mature understanding of risk between government and private sector uh, in, in our countries. And I just wondered how that fits with the logic of you know, the all-powerful connected autocracies, particularly Beijing with its close but fracturing relationship with its tech community. So how do you see the balance of cyber power and how's it changing? So thanks and nice to see you, Michael. Um, it's a great question and actually partly because of what's happening and because of what's been happening in 2022, not just these breaches. You know, we've talked a lot about stuff that originates in Russia and we've talked relatively little this morning about China. And I think the China thing is quite, is really interesting and probably in the long term, despite all the horrors of 2022, much more consequential. There's um, every British senior security official that I know claims ownership of the phrase that when it comes to technological security, um, Russia is bad weather and China is climate change. And because um, uh, it's a really neat way of putting it. And, um, you know, Russia is hacking America's internet. It doesn't have its own. China has its own. And you're right about the fracturing relationship um, with the tech companies because, you know, I think... It used to be more complicated than it now is because, um, you know, um, uh, we, I personally think we are pretty much past the point of no return in terms of the split, you know, the splinter net, the, the evolution of two technospheres, one US-led, one uh, Chinese-led. That, require, that um, was already necessitating the more or less complete co-option of, China, of China's tech companies by its government, which, you know, used to be a matter of interesting debate, and now I think, you know, it's much less interesting because it's much more monolithic. Um, the Biden Chips Act, we know it's only, what, a month old, and so it's not really operational yet, but if it works out as planned, you know, it massively accelerates this, um, this process. So what does that mean for us? Um, I think it means, firstly, um, we are now, it, it's, a, it's a very different phase, um, and it's a very different set of problems, because it's not just about securing our own networks, although it, I'll come back to that. It's actually about you know, which model is better, which model works better, which model persuades the rest of the world to adopt it, um, uh, which leads to more economic growth. You know, it's essentially a, a, a race. And you can, see that you can see in the Biden Chips Act you know, a pretty straightforward strategy to increase the pace of America in the race and slow down the pace of China. And it does involve sort of major uh, disruption. So um, that's where we're at. It, I think this, the, um, it means two more things. One is that you know, concepts of, I won't call it cybersecurity because it's way broader than that, but concepts of you know, resilience, sustainability uh, in the technological world are now much, much harder. When I look at the challenge from China, I almost hark back with nostalgia to the days where all we had to worry about was the three PLA firing stuff at us in a pew pew way. Because although they could be quite good, conceptually dealing with that's quite simple. You just try and get some capabilities that mean that you have more good days than they do. That's it, it's attritional stuff. Now you're talking about, you know, I mean, things like the 5G controversy at its heart was the collapse of the Western technological industrial base. You know, the problem wouldn't have arisen if it, whatever, the rights and wrongs of various decisions, which we won't go into, whatever the rights and wrongs of various decisions, um, the at its problem was the fact that, um, you know, uh, Western industrial capability had collapsed. How you do that, how you, safeguard that across democratic market economies is a really, really tough problem. You know, if you think of a NATO summit, 
you do a security agreement, there's a standing bureaucracy there, and you tell a bunch of defense ministries to go and cooperate with each other. When you do something like the G7 2021 declaration on you know, working together to keep technology free and open, what happens bureaucratically? What action? You know, economic departments, trade departments aren't configured to do this sort of thing, but so we need to, we need to rethink that. But then the final thing to link it back to this conversation, Michael, is that um, if we're going to have two technospheres, it's absolutely vital that we maintain public confidence in the security of our own, and that does bring you back to boring matters of network security and making sure that people aren't getting letters, every, emails every week saying your debt is gone, people aren't turning up at shops that tills don't work because they've been ransomware, etc., etc. So I think, you know, we're in a, we're in a new era now, uh, technological sustainability and resilience and security has got a lot more complicated. We've got time for one more question and Fergus... Sorry, too long answer. Fergus, you also had your hand up before, so we'll go to you. Great. Uh, thanks, Catherine. Thanks, Kieran. It was a great presentation. Um, I, I assume your ears might have pricked up when the Minister said that she wanted Australia to be the most cyber-safe place in the world, given that the UK also wants to be that. And I'm just wondering, given... Both countries would like to be the most cyber safe. How do you me do? You have any sort of tips on how you measure progress in this area? Well, it's really interesting because um, Duncan um, uh, very kindly mentioned the ITU uh, uh, survey, where we went from eighth when I started to first when I finished. We're now back in second, but you know we were first when I left uh, the US took over. Um, I think it's a it's a um, yeah. it's a really immature issue. And, you know, given that I'm in a university and work in a university, I think we can say more research is needed. Because, um, you, actually, one bit, of, one bit of research, one bit of PowerPoint you could do in half an hour, um, and I know the main measures, is you can get spectacularly different results uh, on this uh, if you're measuring different countries. So the ITU is essentially about preparedness. And one of the weaknesses of the ITU thing is you get a point for having a strategy. It doesn't matter if it's any good. You get a point for just having one. Because you go back 10 years, lots of countries didn't have one. You get a point for having an institution, such as the ACSC, because lots of countries didn't have them. You look at other ones, it's about incidences of malware. They lead to completely mad results. <laughs> like Apparently, at one point, Rwanda was the safest country in the world. Um, um, and you know, it didn't adjust for things like mobile phone take up, etc. So there are um, there are uh, you know, wildly varying uh, ways of, um, of 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 doing this. I think there are some technical measures, such as you know, um, that we've relied on in terms of trying to measure our own process uh, progress in terms of um, things like um, prevalence of maliciously hosted um, uh, uh, websites. You know. Um, level and extent of data breaches, um, uh, etc. Incidences of ransomware. So there are various sort of harm Im Im impacts. There are various sort of, if you like, digital health uh, measures and so on. But I do think it's something that we should be working more on. And uh, in particular, I don't just mean it for the sort of satisfaction of working out whether you know Claire or I, if we ever, um, you know, the minister, and if we ever end up, um, you know, in five years' time at this gig again, saying who won. Um, it's it's also you know it's really really important for things like insurers, you know if um, and getting this to work properly, you know if a company says right we've put in place this set of reforms and uh, we've bought these capabilities and this is the way we're now working. Well, how does that then translate into you know, a healthy incentive by way of a lower premium uh, in a way that's going to make the market work well? So I do think one of the things we should be focusing on, and again, it's quite boring, it's quite technocratic, is those, is, is those measures. You know, you talk to politicians, I've talked to, I've talked to some legislators across the aisle uh, here in Canberra yesterday, I've talked to UK politicians over the years. You know, there is a point where sometimes politicians will say, well, look, you know, show me what we got for this public investment. And um, at the moment, I'm not always confident and we know how to answer that as robustly as we should. Fantastic. I've learnt a lot this morning, Kieran, that boring is better, that we need to be able to measure things uh, and their impact regardless of, um, of what it is so that we understand how much damage is being done to us and whether our counter responses are appropriate, uh, as well as the pessimistic uh, assessment that we've, we've lost the Western tech industrial base, which... Um, we can get it back. Which was exactly <laughs> how I was going to close to say that, and, and we've got to work hard uh, with um, our partners, uh, including the UK, the US and others, on absolutely um, getting that back and making sure that that tech sphere you were talking about brings our other partners in our region along as well, which is something we didn't cover, but I know is um, critical and a critical conversation in Canberra, but also at the ANU as well.